Hi everyone, and welcome to this second lecture. And in this lecture, we're going to take a little bit of a deviation, and it might seem strange. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about philosophy. And if you remember in the last lecture, we focused on social imaginary and the building blocks for how we make meaning. And uh, in this lecture, what we want to do is focus on the patristic church. And what do I mean by patristic? Patristic refers to what they call the church fathers. So many of the early uh, church leaders who developed and began to do theology and began to shape biblical and theological teaching in the church. And so we're really dealing here with the ancient church. So one of the things we want to do is talk about the linguistic and philosophical tools that they had to make sense of the Bible and make sense of Christianity. An example of this comes in one of the earliest creeds. We'll spend some time talking about creeds down the road, but for now we'll talk about the Nicene Creed. And the Nicene Creed starts by saying, We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of the same essence as the Father, homoousius. Now, I stop there and focus on that word homoousius because it's a Greek word. And this word be, uh, really distinguishes Christian theology early on. At the Council of Nicaea, they're trying to figure out what is the relationship between the Father and the Son. And this word homoousius becomes very significant and important. Now, many of you don't know what homoousius is. You don't speak Greek, and that's totally fine. Uh, yet, that word and that idea has had a profound impact on Christianity through the centuries. So how does Greek thinking become an important part of the development of Christian theology? That's what we want to focus on. And so uh, in this lecture, I want to explore the theological perspective of Plato. Now, how do we make sense of Plato? And, and I'm, I'm more specifically looking at Plato's uh, view of knowledge. How do we know anything? And it's from his uh, understanding of knowledge that we get his view of reality. And it really boils down to the relationship between things that don't change, the eternal, and things that do change, the material. What is the relationship between these two things or these two ideas? And so Plato comes up with a very hierarchical understanding of reality in which the changeless things, the eternal things, what we might call the spiritual things, are higher than the material. So let's begin to use an example of trees. So here's a, a picture of, you know, five different types of trees. And if we were together, I would say to you, what is this? And you would say tree. And I would say, how do you know? And you'd say, probably because, well, somebody taught me this. And I would say to you, what somebody has taught you is the association of the word, the letters, the sounds, tree in English. And, you know, you have multiple words for tree in other languages. That's what you've learned. But Really, when you look, your mind is, is making sense of this thing, and all of these things are different from one another. You've got one that dropped its leaves in winter. You've got evergreen trees. You've got a sickly um, Charlie Brown tree. Uh, but yet we, all, we call them all trees. How does this work? And what is the relationship between the material tree and the idea of tree, what we might call treeness? And so what Plato develops is his theory of the forms. He believes that there exists in the heavenly realms these, these ideas, these forms, out of which the material stuff gets made. So if you think of Play-Doh, if you ever used Play-Doh before and you had those little forms, you took the Play-Doh in and you press it down and it would make a superhero or, you know, Barbie or, or whatever, whatever it would make. Um, this, this is a way of thinking about the forms from a platonic perspective. You have this eternal treeness that is unchanging that then becomes the foundation for 
the, the creation of these material trees. Now, there's something else that, that is really important to understand here, and this is the word participation. Each of these material trees participate in the reality of treeness. So how do we know that a tree is a tree? Well, our minds are able to connect with the idea of treeness. And by connecting with that idea of treeness, we then look out at the world and we see these things and we're able to recognize them as trees. Now, in their material reality, they grow, they change, they get deformed, they die. And so there's change. Um, and so we might say one tree is better than another. Well, how do we make that determination? Because we have an idea of treeness, an ideal treeness by which we then judge all of these other trees. And so what Plato is arguing is there exist these forms that allow us then to look at the world and make sense of, of the world. But we, we have to understand how participation works. Uh, the material reality participates in the idea of treeness. Our minds, which are rational, then participate or are able to make sense of that idea of treeness and help us then look at the world and know something about the world. And so we can talk about treeness, dogness, humanness, all of these different forms that exist. Now, for, for Plato, there was also higher forms, beauty, justice, the good, uh, these types of forms as well. How do we know what justice is? Well, there's a real justice that exists in the heavenly realms. And then when we look out in the world and we see things as, as either just or unjust, we're judging it based upon this idea of, of justice or freedom or whatever word uh, concept we can, we can think of. Um, and so what's important for us to recognize is the human condition for Plato. And he has this thing called the allegory of the cave. And this is a drawing of the allegory of the cave. And the story goes like this. Humans are trapped inside of a cave. They're hanging upside down. There's a fire behind them where these puppets are going by and they're casting shadows along the wall. The humans who are enslaved in this cave think that the shadows are real. They think the shadows are reality. Well, then someone escapes. You can see the, the guy there is, is, has escaped. And he goes up out of the cave and into the real world and he sees the sun. Now, initially, the sun blinds him because he's not used to seeing reality. But then his eyes begin to adjust and he realizes the world of the cave was not the real world. He is now in the real world. And so he runs back down into the cave to try to tell everybody but in doing so, he comes back into the dark. His eyes aren't used to the dark. So he fumbles around looking, looking stupid, looking foolish. And so people don't believe him. So what is the allegory about? Well, the allegory of the cave, the cave is the material world, the material reality, the senses, the world of the senses. And we are enslaved by this material reality, thinking that this is all that there is. Uh, and in reality, there's a higher reality, the reality of the forms, the ideas. And the sun for Plato becomes uh, an important symbol for light, for wisdom that shines and shows us reality. And so the philosopher is the one who escapes the cave and goes up, sees reality, tries to go back down and help other people understand, but often looks foolish. And for Plato, that person was Socrates. For Plato, Socrates was the wisest man. In, in, in some sense, uh, for Plato, Socrates was the incarnation of wisdom, where we heard that idea before. Um, now, you can see some of the connections with Christianity. Humanity is enslaved, fallen into sin, right? We, Jesus is the light who comes into this world to show us. And then we come to understand who God is and leads us out of uh, to slavery, to sin and death and into this new reality. So there's a lot of connection with this platonic uh, worldview. The problem, however, comes with this idea that the material in the platonic world, the material isn't evil necessarily, but it is less real because it changes. It's in flux. 
And the spiritual is the highest thing. And so what happens in Christianity by taking in this kind of Greek thought is there com- becomes to see this, this sense of the material is, uh, again, not evil, but it's less important than the spiritual. And it raises all kinds of questions about whether or not this is truly a biblical perspective, but we'll talk about that uh, down the road. So a contemporary example um, of this is the Matrix films. If you've seen the Matrix films, um, you know they're enslaved. They don't know that they're enslaved. They've they've got this uh, false reality that they think is real, but it's not. And they can kind of sense there's something off. And then Neo escapes and and goes into reality. And the whole point then is to free people from the Matrix um, so that they can actually live uh, live real lives. And so you get this scene in the Matrix where he gets plugged back in. So he's out, he's plugged back in, and they talk about the projection of your digital self. Where does meaning lie? And so in the Matrix, the first film especially, you're getting this idea that uh, reality is a construct of our minds. Now, if we go back to... Uh, Plato's understanding of the forms and the importance of reason, we can see how reason then plays a, a crucial role then in the construction of reality. And so in one way, we have to get outside of our physicality, the things that change our embodiedness, and um, somehow through philosophy for Plato, we need to um, recognize the truth about uh, reality and the truth about the world. Uh, And so there's a hierarchy in Platonic thought, the rational and then the spirit and the appetitive. So the appetites are the sensual things that keep us locked down into the, uh, the physical world. They keep us distracted from really truly understanding who we are and what it means to be a human being. And the whole point is to transcend this through reason through the wisdom of the philosophers and come to an understanding uh, of the truth. Now, I think it's important for us to recognize that for Plato and this understanding of the forms, reality gets put into a higher and lower. The spiritual is higher and the material uh, material reality is lower. And so the soul through reason, is connected to that higher reality, whereas the body is connected to that lower sensual reality. Now, it's it's important to recognize that Plato isn't necessarily saying that the body is evil, but he does see the body as something to be overcome. The idea is to overcome the material reality uh, in a certain sense. And again, one of the important phrases here is this word participation, that the material reality is participating in the higher forms. Now, one of the words that gets used in this Platonic perspective is the word logos. And the logos is the go-between between between the forms and the uh, material reality. It's, It's the means by which the forms are brought into the material reality. And that word logo shows up in John, uh, in John 1. In the beginning was the word, the logos, the word was God, the word was with God. Uh, and so that idea of participation is going to be very important for us to understand patristic Christianity. So when we think about the Eastern Orthodox Church, for example, and I tried in the last lecture to talk a little bit about icons, the idea that the picture participates in the reality that it represents is grounded here in this kind of platonic understanding of participation. You move through the picture beyond to what the picture represents and is is participating in. Now, what's also important here is a recognition that these ideas or forms exist outside of the human mind. They have their own existence, their own reality. Now, we talked about the porous nature of reality with Charles Taylor. And so in this platonic sense, these forms are are impacting material reality and, and the line between them is porous. We see this also in Christianity early on, the sense of the spiritual and the material engaging and interacting with one another. Now, this, this 
picture here is an attempt to try to summarize this idea from a platonic perspective. You see here the form of beauty that exists in the heavenly realms, and you see in the next level this, this bearded person who is thinking about beauty, and in thinking about beauty, that concept, that concept is directly connected to beauty in and of itself. How can we know beauty? Because our mind, our reason connects to the form of beauty. And then we're able to see beauty beauty in the world, in these various entities. Um, but it's important to recognize that the form of beauty is higher than the ways in which beauty gets represented in the world. And these things change, and some things are more beautiful than others. You can also then see that the imitations of beauty are even less real. Um, so you talk about a photograph, a, a painting, or, or whatever, that's less real than the actual real thing. But that material thing is less real than the concept or the form of beauty in which it's all participating in. So this is the, the Platonic underst understanding of the forms. And it's very important for us to understand this briefly uh, so we can understand what's going on in some of the early patristic theology, especially as we read Augustine, as we engage Augustine's confessions. What we're going to find is Augustine sees in Neoplatonism or Platonism um, a reality here. This makes sense. And this is what is going to lead him to become a Christian. And much of his Christianity then has this Neoplatonic flavor to it. So what is my point? My point is the social imaginary of ancient Christianity, patristic Christianity, is Greek thought. It is this uh, Platonic worldview. And this is what is going to inform the ideas and the language and all of these things they're going to use to try to make sense of Christianity. Now, am I saying that Christianity is nothing more than Neoplatonism? No. What I'm trying to help us recognize is this is the philosophical language and the tools that get used in the early church by which they begin to try to make sense of God and Jesus Christ. And so from here now, in the next, next lecture, what we'll do is we'll begin exploring some of these theological perspectives. We'll talk about the formation of the Christian canon, and then we'll talk about apostolic succession. And this idea of participation is going to be crucial for understanding apostolic succession.